Well, how many of you know I have a tennis racket with me up here this morning? If you arrived late, you missed. We put on a show here at Park Plaza. We had a bat in here this morning. And so I texted Shannon and said, please bring me a tennis racket. As of now, it is my understanding he has gone to the balcony, to the foyer, and he is now out of the building. Yay! All right. At 829, he was still dive bombing this stage. And so, hey, if you want to know what our morning was like this morning, we're going to do video one, Jeff. Uh, John Candy, yeah, I come here and I try to be in prayer. I try to get my mind ready to preach. This is more like what this morning was like. Afraid of a little bat. <sighs> So, it buzzed me. We need a plan. It's bigger than I thought. It's about a two-pounder. Two-pounder? Yeah, big wings. No. Big wings. Oh, no. It's like... got the teeth. Terrible. Frightening. Wow. We, I think we have to, uh, we have to do something. What we need, Roman, big plan, big plan. That's what we our plans, if you had been here this morning, we had nets out, we had people, we had a lot of loving members saying, I got a gun in the car, and uh, which lets me know your servants, but also scares me that you're bringing guns to church. And I said, well, it would take a shotgun. No problem, I got that covered. And so anyway, thank you for your service, but no thanks this morning. Uh, boy, it has been a wild evening with bats and tornadoes, our Wi-Fi. We had to create a new PowerPoint this morning. All of that didn't get transferred over. So this morning, we're going to have courage and mow through. That is the topic of our sermon today. Before we get to that, let me make you aware of a special event in the life of our church um, two weeks from today, August 20th, we're going to have a short-term mission opportunity Sunday. We have asked the heads of our mission sites, and so you have a, a family or a, a deacon or someone in charge of uh, South Africa or Peru or Honduras or New Orleans, and we met with them months ago and we said, you know, sometimes we, we spring it on our members, hey, a mission trip's coming up in a couple of months, uh, half a year, and that's a lot of time except for some of our members are like, yeah, I've got to mark out, I've got to plan my vacation time, and so we asked them to list our mission trips out as best as they can. Now we know that the Holy Spirit, that God may have different plans and do something different, but we have got our mission trips for the next year as best we can listed out. And so on August 20th, you, a family, a class, a youth ministry can come and hear about when a mission trip is going to New Orleans, to Africa, to Honduras, to Brazil, to Portland, and so many other places, and you can begin to make plans of how you're going to be a part of that trip. After the morning is done, our assemblies at Jinx and Brookside here at Central at Claremore, then all day long on August 20th, there will be mission trip classes, interest meetings, where you can say, okay, 3 o'clock, for example, Africa, I, I think I'll go to that meeting and hear what it's going to take. Is it going to be a medical missionary or a mission? Well, you know, I wanted to do one that was more building houses. Well, that might be more Honduras for you. And so August 20th is going to be a huge Sunday. In fact, next Sunday on the 13th, we'll begin to hand out booklets to prepare you for what is coming on the next week. Also on August 20th, I encourage you to go ahead and begin to read the Gospel of Mark. I have perhaps never been more excited about preaching an upcoming sermon series than I am with this. The Gospel of Mark will begin on August 20th, and I'm super excited and know that God is going to have a great word for you coming from that Gospel beginning on August 20th. At this time, if you'd be turning your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, as you're turning there and as we're waiting for that new series in the Gospel of Mark to begin, I want to take the next two weeks to preach on the topic of courage. As we've got eight-year-olds headed back to school, as we've got 18-year-olds headed off to school perhaps for the first time, as we've got young men and women who have signed up to serve in our military, as we've got parents and teachers, as we've got folks who need a word, 
on courage. These next two weeks, we want to talk about courage and what it is to lead and live the courageous life in Christ. As you turn into 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1, let me pray over us this morning for God to speak. Almighty God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather here. We pray, Father, for our city and those just this past evening that experienced damage and fright. Father, 26 going to the hospital uh, due to the storms that passed through. Father, we pray for them. Father, we pray that we may be of service to them as you lead us into that opportunity. And Father, this morning we pray that you would speak to us. Father, open up our minds and hearts to the command that you give more than any other in the Bible. Do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. It is in your son's name that the church says, Amen. As you're there in 2 Kings 5 and verse 1, you see the subheading in many of your Bibles, Naaman healed of leprosy. This morning I wanted to revisit and even expound a great deal upon a sermon that I preached five years ago on not so much Naaman, but another nameless small character that appears in the story of Naaman being healed of his leprosy. Naaman was not just a great general. The language used in that original Hebrew language is, he is chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. He is the general of generals, and he's not a bad general on top of that. He is a fantastic general. He is a Storman Norman Schwarzkopf Deluxe. He doesn't just go and plan battles. It says that he himself is a valiant soldier. He's not at the back of the lines. He's at the front of the charge, and he is one that is great in battle. Naaman is powerful. He is prestigious. He is popular with the people. He is not a Jew, so to speak, but the Jewish God, our God at the time, is behind him. We'll see in Scripture in just a moment that it says, the Lord was with Naaman and giving him victories in the battles that he undertook. If there was a candidate at that time for who's who on the planet Earth, Naaman would be on that short list. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this character and the character that we'll get to that is the topic of our sermon today on being courageous. 2 Kings 5 and 1. Now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but then comes a conjunction that changes everything, this valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He is successful, he is wealthy, he is popular, he has position, but every morning, so to speak, when Naaman looks in the mirror, all of that fades away quickly because he is reminded of a skin disease, a death sentence in the time in which Naaman lived. He is reminded that he has leprosy. Naaman has finally, the fighter, gotten into a fight that he can't win. But let's continue to read in 2 Kings 5. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a, a young girl. The language here is she's age 8 to 13, a little maid. They go out and take captive this young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. And this young girl said to her, Naaman's wife, the mistress, if only your husband, my master, would see the prophet who is in Samaria, that would be Elisha, he would cure him of his leprosy. An amazing thing to think about here as we begin to talk about people who are being courageous, people who want to make a real difference in our society. As I look down at this youth ministry that's about to head back into the largest mission field in our city as they head back into school, as I look out at this larger 
youth ministry, these young at heart, as we head back into our mission fields, the workplace, taking kids to school, the lives that God has allowed us to live and called us to live for Him, we look at this young girl and we're marveling at the fact that she could have been focused in on her lack of resources. She could have focused in on the fact she had no position, she had no power, she had no access to medical care, she had no great and grand wisdom on there in that foreign country how Naaman could be made well in any form or fashion. She could have focused in on her lack of resources. She could have focused in on the gap between this little maid, this fourth grade age girl, and the powerful Naaman. She could have focused in on the fact that she was a girl in a male-dominated society. She could never offer up anything to the one who needed no help. She could have focused in on the fact in the gap that she was a captive, that she was a servant, that her age was young. She could have focused in on the fact that the size and scope of this problem, leprosy, I mean, this isn't just a common cold. This isn't a wound in battle that it'll take a while to heal from. This is a death sentence, and the great and respected and regarded Naaman is going to be a humiliated outcast before this is said and done. She could have focused in on all of those things, and she could have made an excuse. I wonder how many of these young people in this next season, as school gets underway, could believe the lie, freshmen around seniors. Well, I, I just focus in on the gap. I mean, I'm a ninth grader. They're a twelfth grader. What can I offer? My resources, my position, the gap. I'm going to focus in on that, and there's the excuse. How many of us in our lives have gotten locked into a role where we don't stand up for Christ? The culture is more and more set against us, and so our mouth is going to remain shut, and we continue to be a people who focus on all of the reasons why we shouldn't stand up And in the middle of this young girl's thought process, we catch two words that give us a clue into why she does what she does. And in courageous fashion, despite the gap in the society and the structure of it, despite her lack of resources, despite the leprosy that no one recovers from in that time, her two words are this, if only. That's where she goes when she talks to Naaman's wife. If only your husband, if only the great general, if only my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. I think he might do some good. In fact, it can't hurt. There's no doubt. If only he will go, the prophet in Samaria can cure him of his leprosy. Our first point this morning is this. Believe things can be different. If you're a business owner and you don't have a culture in your business that exalts Christ at every turn, first thing you need to do this morning is believe things can be different. Sometimes we like to get to action steps. First action step this morning is believe things can be different. Well, my family has gone away. It's not off the deep end, so to speak, but we don't pray anymore as a family. Oh, on occasion before a meal, but it's more out of rote and routine. We don't gather together, turn off the TV, and come around and open up the Bible. In fact, if we did as a dad, I don't know what I'd say anyway. You need to believe that things can be different. You need to incorporate in your vocabulary, if only. This young girl's faith was not in faith. Her faith was in God. She is referring to a God who is working through a prophet in Israel, and if you go to him, he can change things. We need to believe that things can be different. Some problems are so big. Some problems are so enmeshed. Some problems, some rut, some hurt, some habits, some hang-ups we've been in so long. Some problems are so strength-sapping, so discouraging that we feel trapped. An addiction, an unforgiving heart, 
a marriage that is suddenly or for some time has been loveless, we need to believe that things can be different. You know, these young people in front of me, sometimes you and your friends get locked into stereotypes and roles in your school. There may be some today who are being bullied. There may be some that for some reason have gotten locked in the role of not those being bullied, but they are the, the bully. You go, well, I don't see any kids that are just strapping huge this morning. To be a bully today, you don't have to be one who's strapping huge like back in my day. You just got to have one of these and be able to sh send a sharp text, a cutting text. Well, that's who I am, and I hate that I'm that way. There are some of us today who have been locked into other roles. You know, Mitch, if I ever shared my faith in my office, in my workplace, if I ever had a prayer over anyone, that's just not who I am. We need to believe that things can be different. Our marriage is one that is loveless. It's not one that I would ever call romantic. It's one where the last time I wrote a card to my wife or my wife wrote a card to me, you need to believe today that things can be different. Amen, church? In your neighborhood. It'd be weird for me to share my faith now. I haven't had this neighbor for six months. I haven't had him for six years. There's some of us today, I've lived next door to him for two decades. I've never invited him to church once or broached on the subject. And the guilt I feel is huge, but it is what it is. No, that statement's done, it is what it is. We believe in a God who can make all things new. And we believe that things can be different. Dr. Neil Rose, in his book titled, If Only, says there are two types of regrets. Those regrets that come from action and those regrets that come from inaction. The former, sins of commission. And the latter, sins of omission, things that I don't do. The sins of omission, when we one day see our Lord, will be the ones that we truly regret. And they come about because we don't truly believe that God can make a difference through us. We need to believe that things can be different. And number two, we need to take steps to then make things different. Number one, we need to take steps that need to be taken within us. Okay, did you catch me this morning? Before you ever do anything outside of yourselves, those men who love to fix situations, before you ever do anything with your actions, you need to do something with your attitude. I haven't even touched on yet this young girl. One of the main reasons, if you were going to give her a reason why she should not have helped Naaman with this wonderful prescription for a cure for leprosy was not her lack of resources, was not the gap in the societal structure, was not the fact that leprosy was insurmountable. Her main excuse should have been, I lived with my mom and dad. They came and took me captive. Our word for that today is POW, prisoner of war. I now serve, I'd rather be home, Mom and dad, did they survive or did they, I don't, I don't know. And so she should be there with a crummy heart going, anything you get, Buster, should be coming your way. She should be resentful. She should be stuck in just hate and animosity. But instead, she is one who is about letting God work through her. We need to take steps to make things different in our lives, and the first steps we need to take are within us. Before you can ever set anyone else free, i.e., this young girl, if you'd go to Samaria, there's a prophet there that will set you free from this disease. Before you can ever point the way to setting someone else free, you've got to set yourself free by the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Well, no, no, it's not you doing it, Mitch, it's all Jesus. It is all Jesus, but you have to allow him into your heart to do the work. And in this partnership of your surrender and his salvation, he now moves in a way where you are free and can point other people towards that freedom. She could have been a victim. She could have been resentful. The old song, would you be free from the burden of sin? 
Are you free from the burden of sin? Because the song says it accurately. There is power in the blood. I could never get over what was done to me. I could never get over this grudge-filled, hate-filled, resenting heart. There's power in the blood. It would take a wonder. There's wonder-working power in the blood. That's the song we sing. We believe that the steps we need to take to make things different from God's wisdom and His good word is setting ourselves to be free by the freedom He gives us in Christ and then telling others in our testimony there is a way to get rid of that disease called sin. Are you free from the burden of sin? Are you free today? Where sin really comes from is from selfishness, from the burden of self. If I've told this story once, I've told it five times, so let's go ahead and make it six today, okay? The best story I have ever heard on going back to school, someone right now is going, get on these kids, Mitch, preach at them. I want to preach at all of us today. On going back to our lives, Tom McLeod's watching today from Brookside, and here it comes again. I'm riding back from Oklahoma City with Tom, two fantastic kids, TJ and Mickey have gone through our youth ministry. And I say, Tom, how did you do it? And I expect this, oh, shucks, I don't really know. God did it all attitude. And he has that God did it all attitude, but I'm blown away when he says, this is what I did. Really? There's an answer for how these kids turned out the way they turned out? He goes, yeah, here it is. Step one, step two, step three, all in one. And I'm driving, and as I'm driving, I'm taking mental notes. I get my kids on the day before school starts and I grab them by the shoulders and I say, here's your mission. When you go to that lunchroom and you see the kid, all the other kids have friends. They're all sitting with people and you see that one kid, empty space, empty space, empty, 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 empty space and they're by themselves. Your mission is to go get your lunch tray And you pull up a chair right next to them and you sit down and you love them and you serve them. And when I heard that, my mind went to, I I confess sin right here, social suicide. (laughs) Really, that's what you did to your kids? And he said, Mitch, have you seen my kids lately? They did great. He said, all the other kids at school show up like this. Who's going to feed me? Who's going to be kind to me? Who's going to serve me? And my kids show up. God's got a mission through me, called to me, and there they are. They're empowered. They're not victims. They're taking steps to be done with selfishness and sin and invest in others. And oh, by the way, the old axiom in the scripture is true that when you help another, you can at the same time not also help yourself up. That is not bad advice for school. That is also not bad advice for the way each and every one of us live our lives. Let us be people who take steps to make things different where we are with the opportunities God has given us. Another story on taking steps, not only within you, but where you are. About two months ago, a storm rolls through Broken Arrow, much like the one that hit Midtown last night. Trees are split in our neighborhood. One guy, a street over. I I didn't know his name, never met him. He's not my next door neighbor. He's not my across the street neighbor. He's the guy, turn left, down the street neighbor. He's lived there since 1999. We moved in in 2002. So well over a decade coming up on two, we've been in the same neighborhood and have never met. That storm splits one of his trees right down the middle. He saws them up into big old logs, puts them out on the curb. They're there for a day, a week, two weeks, going on a month. And I would drive by in my truck and say, man, can he get rid of that stuff? (laughs) It's way too big. The garbage man's never going to pick it up. And one Friday night as I was headed up here to celebrate recovery, I looked at my wife and my daughter, and they were putting on work clothes. I said, Shannon, Ashton, where are y'all going? Well, we're going to borrow your truck and go move all those logs in front of his house and take them to the dump. 
well, I'm going to serve the Lord right now. That's how, inside, I'm like, I should have done that weeks ago. Honey, I've got to go to CR. I told them I'd come. No, no, you go. This will be a good time for me to spend with Ashton. So they go and take one load and two loads to the dump and all that stuff away. His wife is so touched, she tells her husband who's out of town. His name is Carl. Carl then shows up at my door. This is how the Lord will bless you. I find out that Carl is an award-winning barbecue champion. <laughs> and Carl says, I want to repay you. No, no, you don't have to repay me. I want to cook barbecue for you. Yes, you can. <laughs> so last night, he shows up at the house with more meat than I could eat in a week. And this conversation begins. What church do you go to? Well, Park Plaza Church of Christ at 51st and Sheridan. He gets quiet. He says, is that where Patrick Murphy goes? I said, yeah, that's where Patrick Murphy goes. He said, I knew it because Patrick has been telling me about that church and inviting me to it for the last five years. I said, Carl, you really need to come. He says, I think I will. I can't come tomorrow, but you'll see me there the next week or two. Let me talk to you real quick about taking steps to make a difference. In your neighborhood, when you see the trees blown over, don't pull a Mitch Wilburn and say, I hope the garbage men finally get rid of that. Do something about it. In your neighborhood, when someone's hurting, do something about it. In your family, in your office place, when somebody's hurting, don't pull a Mitch Wilburn, pull a Shannon and Ashton Wilburn. Other example in that story, I love the fact that I mentioned 51st and Sheridan, and his mind immediately went to, that's where my friend Pat goes. He's been inviting me to come there, not five times. How many of us can say, I've been inviting a friend for five years? Let's take steps to make a difference. Well, Mitch, I've got a real weakness that I can't get over. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect when you lack resources, when you're weak. Well, if then that's the case, therefore I will boast in my weaknesses. Bring them on all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest more on me. Number three, be bold in making things different. Go public. Step over the line. Do something that in retrospect you will ask yourself, what was I thinking? Have you all heard about the new position that NASA has made open? Have you heard about this? Planetary Protection Officer. They have been inundated with people applying for this $187,000 a year salary. The technical term it is to ensure the avoidance of organic and biological, excuse me, biological contamination in human and robotic space exploration. So when we send a rover to Mars, we don't want to get our stuff up there. And when the Martian rover comes home, we don't want to get their stuff down here, i.e. the sci-fi community is all pumped because NASA is hiring their first alien protection program. They have been inundated with people questioning this position. But my favorite is nine-year-old Jack Davis. Jack has applied officially to protect the planet Earth from all aliens. My name is Jack Davis. I would like to apply for the planetary protection officer job. I may be nine, but I think I would be a good fit for the job. One of my reasons is my sister says that I'm an alien. <laughs> also, I have seen almost all the space alien movies, including Men in Black, I'm Your Man. <laughs> Jack's being bold. <laughs> I think I'll go for that job at age nine. What are you going to do that's going to be bold? Brad, I'm going to talk about you a little bit this morning. I get back from my vacation. Phil Smith catches me. He says... You know, Brett White is going to Panama on a mission trip. 
And I said, no, I didn't know that. Brett shares my fear of being 38,000 feet in the air in a tube going way too fast. I said, no, I didn't know Brett was going. And Phil says, yeah, he got touched by Raul's mission presentation on the Sunday night while you were gone. And he's not only going, he's asked me to go. This is one of those steps where sometimes you're bold and you step out. And afterwards you begin to think, what in the world have I done? But you step out and you're bold. Start the Bible study. Share your faith. Pick up the limbs in front of your neighbor's house. Don't just believe things can be different. Take steps to make things different and be bold. Francisco came up to me this week more pumped than I've ever seen him. He told me that Pete Shaw this last week or the week before preached in the Iglesia de Cristo. I said, I didn't know Pete knew Spanish. Francisco said he did very, very well. There was a time when Pete didn't know Spanish. But now he is taking a step in boldness to be out there. And it not only encourages him, it encourages guys like me who are looking on. Two things and we'll be done today. One reason we're not bold is we focus on how many things could go wrong. Well, they may not like me if I share my faith. It may be awkward if I invite them to church and they don't come. It may be awkward if I keep inviting them to church year after year after year after year, wondering if God will then bring a storm that will level a tree, and then somehow my preacher's wife will go over and move that, and then as they seek to bless him, then he steps in. We can focus on all the ways God won't work, or we can believe that God will work. We focus many times on how many things can go wrong, and we also focus on how few things can go right. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 4 and verse 27. Here, Jesus is going to play accountant and doctor. He's going to tell us in real numbers how many people in the time of Elisha were healed of leprosy. Luke 4 and 27. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, and he was from Syria. What was this young girl thinking when she said to Naaman, go over there and you'll be healed? Well, I've seen hundreds been, have been healed. Not according to Jesus. No one had been healed. We're talking about bold faith here. Get you in trouble faith here. You imagine Naaman going over there, wasting his time, not getting healed, storming back. That was a big, you know, wild goose chase. She didn't focus on the many things that could go wrong. She didn't focus on the few or the no things that could go right. She focused on the fact there was a God in Israel and he could change things and she was bold. Let us believe. Let us take steps and let us be bold in our schools, in our lives, in our church, in our marriages, in our relationship. Because brothers and sisters, we've got someone much bigger than Elisha in our corner. Our word is not you can go over there and be healed of your leprosy and your skin disease because Elisha is present. Our word is you can be healed of your sin because Jesus is present. You can be healed in your family, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your addictions, in your hurt in your habits, and your hang-ups, because there is wonder-working power in the blood of Christ. And as Paul would say, thus I have believed, and there as it is written, thus I have spoken. You step out there. You don't just believe things can be different. You speak up and you step up. In retrospect, you're going, where in the world have I placed myself now? God, if you don't step in, this is going to get ugly real fast, but by faith. Paul would later go on to say, by faith I speak up, believing in the same faith and resurrection power that was in Christ will be present in me. Today, how can you be one that believes and takes steps 
and is bold to bringing a difference to your life today. Can we pray for you unto that? Will you come and give your life to Christ today? Will you come and be done with trying to get that love back in your marriage under your own power and come today and repent of that sin and trust in Christ? Today, will you come as we stand and as we sing?